Hello and a very warm welcome to yet another edition of World Panorama. Here we are getting you your weekly dose of major international news with a perspective. I'm Sana Khan. Before we get you detailed reports, here's a look at the top stories this week. India-Pakistan lock horns in a diplomatic battle over firing, killing of soldiers at LOC. Can the arch rival ease tensions after the flare-up? Syrian government frees prisoners in exchange for 48 Iranians. Opposition says swap exposes reliance on Iran even as Assad refuses to step down. Tens of thousands rally for ailing Hugo Chavez in a symbolic inauguration in Venezuela. Opposition call for him to cede power. And Sergio Perez, hopeful of F1 World Championship in first season with McLaren, the 22-year-old Mexican replaces Lewis Hamilton. This week, the focus is on the latest incidents of ceasefire violation, which got further complicated when an Indian soldier's body was found mutilated at the LOC. While Pakistan has denied any decapitation, it has sought to project the incident as a retaliation for an earlier incident on 6 January in the Uri sector in which, according to it, a Pakistani soldier was killed by a raiding Indian Army unit. This has been denied by the Indian Army. While such instances of tactical gravity will continue to mar bilateral relations so long as there's no genuine change of mindset in the Pakistan Army towards India, Will it be unwise and short-sighted to allow anger over such incidents of, let's say, the 8th of January to undermine the dialogue process or not? Today, let's shed some light on the setback that the bilateral ties face or perhaps a way out between these two nations and possible impact we can see in the days, weeks or even years to come. On the show this week, I welcome Mr. Vinod Sharma, political editor of Hindustan Times, also the president of uh, South Asia Free Media Association. Thanks so much for joining me on the show this week, sir. But before we get to him, here's a look at this report. Lance Nayak Hemraj, one of the two soldiers brutally killed by Pakistani troops in Jammu and Kashmir, cremated at his native village. The funeral pyre lit by his five-year-old son. The incident along the line of control triggered a bitter war of words between the two arch rivals, with tensions spiraling out of control. Highly provocative action by the Pakistan army and the way treated Indian soldiers, that body, is inhuman and we are already in the post of taking up with the Pakistan government. Yesterday, we were a bit appalled and, uh, you know, not pleasantly surprised, unpleasantly surprised to see such strong statements emanating. Four days after, you know, Lance Naik Aslam lost his life and embraced Shahadat in Pakistan, in Pakistan uh, just uh, on Saturday. You did not see, we followed the mechanism. We have a commitment. Uh, to uh, abide by the ceasefire, uh, to abide by the ceasefire and to pursue mechanisms which exist to be able to deal with issues like this and problems like this. And these are two countries which have had immense problems in the past. So let me just say that, uh, you know, and unfortunately, as I was reading a Reuters report last evening, there were contradictory statements coming in. You know, their northern army commander was saying there was no decapitation, there was no beheading, somebody, uh, you know, very... Uh, very uh, responsible sources were saying there was, and then there was, yes, uh, unfortunately, very strong statements. But I think what you saw yesterday was that there was, I believe, um, you know, a sense of trying to de-escalate on their side also uh, from those statements. And I think that is the right way to go. Simultaneously, efforts were being made to control the tensions. In a diplomatic bid to de-escalate Pakistan-India tensions over cross-LOC violence in the disputed Kashmir region, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton instructed U.S. ambassadors in Islamabad and New Delhi to work with the two governments to that end. 
Defence analysts say that India should take a serious note over the surfacing of media reports which claim that lashkar e toiba chief Hafiz Saeed was behind the ceasefire violation and the brutal killings. So I think the reality that some non-state actors have got the kind of influence whereby they enter what you might call as the Pakistani establishment, say Hafiz Saeed is a good example, the lashkar e taiba and its traditional links with Rawal Pindi. I think we should not ignore the media reports which are surfacing and take it seriously. The intelligence agencies and other sources should investigate so that if there is a conspiracy behind it, then our nation should be ready to face it. Clashes between soldiers on the LOC, the de facto border separating Pakistan-administered Kashmir from the Indian side are not usual. Both sides continue to claim the territory in its entirety and consider the LOC as a ceasefire line. They had agreed to a ceasefire in 2003, but it has been violated on several occasions by both countries. All right, let's get on uh, discussion with our guest. Mr. Sharma, the, looking at the recent developments, there's no denying the fact that there has been escalation in violence. Lives have been lost. Uh, how serious do you think is the situation presently? Well, it's serious in the sense that uh, it has uh, damaged the peace process and popular perception. And it has also uh, kind of put some strains uh, in the positive steps that were being taken by both sides. Uh, it's quite surprising that uh, uh, it comes at a time when elections are due in Pakistan mm. and, and there is a conspiracy theory uh, prevalent in Pakistan that certain forces want these elections derailed, uh, though the political class is opposed to any such adventure. Uh, I think that uh, the people uh, who have been normally opposed to peace uh, between India and Pakistan, even a semblance of a dialogue between India and Pakistan, uh, were uh, were perhaps behind this. Uh, I don't rule out that uh, they might be having test support from wherever within the Pakistan army. Hmm. Um, because uh, you see a professional soldier, regardless of which country he comes from, right. does not do this to another professional hmm. soldier. So surely there are some rogue elements, either in the Pakistan army or uh, tacitly supported by the Pakistan army, who have chosen to... Um, create this uh, spectacle uh, to damage the dialogue process. And to what extent do you think it will be damaged? You know, you yourself mentioned their visa agreement is in place, the sports ties uh, were, you know, back on track, the trade was doing good. You see, this, uh, uh, you know, no fire, ceasefire on LOC has been there since 2003. It has been one of the most uh, durable CBMs that mm -hmm. were initiated uh, before uh, uh, President uh, uh, Musharraf and Prime Minister Vajpayee gave their January 6, 2004 statement mm. where Pakistan for the first time said that um, it will not allow its territory to be used by anyone against India. Now, this, this CBM has created a constituency for peace along the two borders. Absolutely. Because I remember that during a visit to Muzaffarabad as part of a delegation of journalists, uh, in 2003, uh, mm. I heard voices. They, there were people in Muzaffarabad who told me that uh, there was a time when they, when they couldn't do their nikah or their <coughs> zanazas along the line of control. And for the first time, uh, they have uh, uh, reaped uh, crop, you know. Uh, they have uh, been able to harvest crop uh, along the line on either side. So I think that this is a CBM which needs to be secured at any cost. Mm. Uh, uh, the Pakistani demand that it be, that there be a third party intervention by the UNMOGIP, right. the United Nations Military Observers Group for India and Pakistan, mm. uh, does not, uh, is untenable in my view, uh, because this is a line which has been bilaterally negotiated. Mm. It wasn't, it wasn't created following mediation by the UN. So if it was a bilaterally <coughs> negotiated LOC, uh, then it has to be, the, all the problems along that have to be negotiated bilaterally. And right. uh, that is what has been the uh, traditional Indian position and which is the correct position. So I think that after the first statement uh, which Inara Bani Khar made, they haven't uh, insisted on that. 
mm. though some people sought to link that statement of Hirana Banikar with the uh, Pakistani presidency of the UN Security Council just now. Uh, so I think that uh, no politics be played if, mm. uh, if, if the Pakistan government thinks it can internationalize this issue. Right. It is not going to uh, be it helping its cause uh, mm. for a longer duration. Absolutely. Uh, because 71 Pact, which has been ratified by the National Assembly of Pakistan, mm. uh, supersedes the UN resolutions uh, which, uh, to which uh, Pakistan al always harps, you know, on which uh, Pakistan always harps uh, when it wants to internationalize the issue. So let's hope that wiser sense will prevail. And uh, let's hope that um, media on either side uh, would be a little more uh, restrained in its approach hmm. uh, because uh, no purpose is served uh, by <coughs> you know engaging in jingoism. Uh, diplomacy is a fine art. Hmm. Uh, it has to be pursued as such. So in fact, uh, Hinara Bani Khar in a statement, you know, very clearly sending out signals that uh, perhaps U.S. asking U.S. to step in and you know perhaps take control of the situation, but. U.S. clearly uh, saying that it's India and Pakistan who have to sort out their differences on their own and U.S. is not willing to step in at this point no, in no, time. That again is a standard position of the United States. Absolutely. You can't be a mediator unless you are accepted as one by both sides. Hmm. So, so, you, so uh, the Americans have been playing a role as a third party hmm. when India and Pakistan were not talking to each other and they were facilitating a proximity dialogue. Hmm. To that extent, one can understand. But for them to become arbitrators to become for them to become uh, you know middlemen or third party in this uh, in this dispute is not acceptable because 71 uh, is a pact uh, that uh, that that uh, help both sides avoid war uh, for a long long period until Kargil Kargil happened and what what has happened uh, along the LOC uh, in recent uh, days uh, almost it's a kind of a uh, you know a minuscule Kargil uh, you see hmm. you intrude and you kill and yeah. the way you kill, you see, this is for the way our soldiers, at least one of our mm. soldiers was done in, uh, the, the, the effort was to create a gruesome impact yeah. uh, in, order to, uh, in order to destroy perceptions on either yeah. side of the border Wh which was uh, done for, in, in favor of dialogue. Uh, you see, the constituency for dialogue is very fragile. Mm. Each time any such thing happens, the first, first casualty is the peak peacenik on the either side. And we need as many peaceniks as possible. And that's what the people uh, who have a vested interest in hostility do to destroy a peace uh, or the constituency of peace or at least neutralize it. All right, Mr. Sharma. So peace is the only way forward. Both nations should realize this and uh, not let anything else come in the way. Let's hope things are better in the days to come. Thanks so much for joining me on the show this week and sharing your thoughts. With that, we take a very quick break. After that, among other reports, we take a look at the campaigning in Israel for the upcoming elections. Stay tuned. You're watching World Panorama. Rebels freed 48 Iranians on Wednesday in exchange for more than 2,000 prisoners, including women and children, held by Syrian authorities. A deal struck after rare negotiations involving regional powers, Turkey, Qatar and Iran. It was the first major prisoner swap since the uprising began against President Bashar al-Assad nearly 22 months ago. Rebels freed 48 Iranians on Wednesday in exchange for more than 2,000 prisoners, including women and children held by Syrian authorities. A deal struck after a rare negotiations involving regional powers, Turkey, Qatar and Iran. The men were accomplished by Iranian ambassador to Syria and arrived in six small buses, looking tired but appeared in good health. <laughs> The release of 48 Iranian visitors, we congratulate Iranian people for the return of their sons to their homeland safe. The Shabal Irani, the Audat Abnaihi, the Watanahum al Um, Salameen. It was the first major prisoner swap since uprising began against President Bashar al Assad nearly 22 months ago. 
Iran is one of Azad's main allies and the Iranians who were seized outside Damascus in August were a major bargaining chip for factions trying to bring down his regime that has killed more than 60,000 people. The exchange also highlighted the plight of tens of thousands of detainees languishing in Syrian prisons, many of whom were picked up at street protests and have not been heard of since. In a speech on Sunday, Azad struck a defiant tone, ignoring international demands to step down and saying he is ready to talk, but only with those who have not betrayed Syria. He also vowed to continue the battle as long as there is one terrorist left, a term the government uses for rebels. Venezuela's government organized what seemed to be an alternative inauguration outside the presidential palace on Thursday. It hosted regional leaders in an unusual show of support for ailing President Hugo Chavez, whose swearing-in ceremony has been indefinitely postponed. Here's a report. Un solo pensamiento. As speculation about Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez's health and the country's political future surges, Chavez's party called for supporters to gather in front of the presidential palace on Thursday in a show of solidarity. The rally comes as authorities continue to reassure Venezuelans that Chavez's government remains unified and intact just days after announcing that the 58-year-old wasn't well enough to be sworn in on Thursday, specified by the constitution as Inauguration Day. A day earlier, Venezuela's top court endorsed the postponement of Chavez's inauguration and ruled that the cancer-stricken president remained the South American OPEC nation's leader. No debe considerarse. It should not be considered that the absence from the territory of Republic configures automatically as a temporary absence in terms of Article 234 of the Constitution of Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela without the head of state himself expressing this by a way of special decree issued specifically for that purpose, which is one of the necessary conditions for that to be considered. Soon after, Venezuela's opposition accused the country's top court of siding with the government. The Supreme Court decided to resolve a problem for the ruling party. So what can I now say to Venezuelans? I am an example and excuse me for speaking in first person. But I am an example of how one must fight against a judicial system that doesn't work. The decision by the Supreme Court opens the door, in theory, for Chavez to remain in office for weeks or months more from a Cuban hospital bed, though there is no evidence he is even conscious. It leaves the South American country in the hands of Vice President Nicolas Maduro, the de facto leader of the government. Chavez's resignation or death would transform politics in the OPEC nation, where he is revered by poor supporters thankful for his social largesse but denounced by opponents as a dictator. In Israel, two weeks before the election, campaign ads are exciting. Unlike the typical U.S. campaign where ads bombard viewers for months before the election day, Israeli ads begin only two weeks before the balloting. And instead of appearing throughout the day, the ads run only during specified blocks of time on each network channel, one after the other. The campaign in Israel for January 22nd parliamentary election has been marked by an even more rightward turn by all the main political parties as economic growth slows and social tensions rise. Here's a look. Israel's political parties launched their television and radio campaign ads in the run-up to January 22nd elections. The advertisements featured the video campaigns of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's party Likud, which is running on a joint ticket with the nationalist Yisrael Betanyu party, led by former Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman. Other parties who launched their campaigns were the centrist Hetyuna party, the left-leaning Labour party, the centrist Yesh Atid party and the far-right Beit Yehudi party. Running under the campaign slogan, a strong Prime Minister, a strong Israel, Netanyahu and Lieberman's Likud Betenyo party has lost some ground to a start-up far-right party led by high-tech millionaire Naftali Bennett. But opinion polls still count Netanyahu as a shoo-in to enlist right-wing parties after the vote and form the next coalition government. In Israel, no single party has ever won a parliamentary majority. 
I'm not sure whether those uh, television political ads will make a great difference among undecideders. Usually, uh, it's a situation of the dynamics, of the momentum of the last few days. And you can tell whether a political ad showing in the television 10 days or 12 days before elections will do the work. My guess, it won't do the work. Israelis who walked the rainy streets of Jerusalem on Wednesday morning were mostly indifferent to the launch of the television campaigns. Anyhow, I don't think that it will influence someone. It's a big, big waste of money, very boring and not funny. It's all very mixed and uh, nobody, there's not one candidate that fits my uh, my viewpoint exactly, so I'm going to have to compromise here and there, and I'm still deciding. In the election, Israelis vote for a party's list of parliamentarians. After the ballot, Israel's president chooses a party leader to try to put together a governing coalition. That is usually, but not always, the head of the party that won the most parliamentary seats. Another short breather. After that, a quick look at the NBRA winners. The precursor to the Academy Awards. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for staying with us. Time now to take a look at some of the other international news in a quick wrap. Here's Globe Watch. Afghanistan's President Hamid Karzai met with members of U.S. Senate on Wednesday and discussed mutual goals for two countries. Republican Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell warmly welcomed Karzai. Karzai met with McConnell and a few other senators in the Foreign Relations and Armed Services panels. The Afghan President declined to answer a question about the number of U.S. troops he would like to see in Afghanistan. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations appointed Lee Leung Min as its new Secretary General during a ceremony at the organization's headquarters in Jakarta on Wednesday. The former Vietnamese Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs replaces Surin Pitsuan of Thailand, who had held the post for five years. The change of power came at a time when ASEAN countries as an emerging markets region face challenging times which require an active role both regionally and internationally, according to participants of the ceremony. Heavy snow and winds of 75 km per hour pounded Romania's north and northeastern parts on Tuesday, closing roads and stranding passengers. Six national roads remain closed through Tuesday. Wintry conditions also forced official buildings to close in Amman, where the report said the conditions were expected to continue for a few more days. While Russian Emergencies Ministry workers used bulldozers to clear the road on a main highway and anti-aircraft guns to shoot into snow on mountains to loosen it and hasten its fall following an avalanche that covered the roadway. More than a month's worth of snow fell over two days in southern Russian region, causing an avalanche that covered the highway and part of a military unit stationed near Russia's border with Georgia. If you've missed the week's biggest sporting events, here's your chance to catch up. We bring you sports action. Welcome back to downtown. Lance Armstrong will break his silence about his lifetime ban from cycling and the doping charges made against him in a televised interview with Oprah Winfrey this week. The interview to be broadcast on the Oprah Winfrey Network on January 17th will be the first the American cyclist has conducted since receiving his ban and the stripping of his seven Tour de France titles. The McLaren Formula One team welcomed new driver Sergio Perez at its futuristic headquarters outside London on Wednesday. The Mexican brought in to replace 2008 world champion Lewis Hamilton after he defected to Mercedes, arrived in an orange McLaren sports car and was greeted by team boss Martin Whitmarsh. Perez is joining another former world champion British driver Jensen Button, who captured the title for McLaren in 2009. It required a lot of patience and overtime, but American Dustin Johnson opened the PGA Tour season with a comfortable victory at the windswept Tournament of Champions in Hawaii on Tuesday. Johnson fired a 5 under 68 on another blustery day at the Kapula Resort to finish four shots clear of defending champion Steve Stricker. 
with the win Johnson becomes the first player since Tiger Woods to win at least one tournament in six consecutive years straight out of college. Johnson posted a 16 under 203 total at the Weather Hit event that was trimmed to three rounds and forced to a rare Tuesday finish because of relentless howling winds that did not allow the first round to be played until Monday. And time now for all the very latest news from the world of movies and lifestyle. Here's our entertainment wrap. Hollywood's biggest stars came together in New York for the National Board of Review Awards Gala on Tuesday night. Zero Dark Thirty, a film about the hunt for Osama bin Laden, picked up the most honours along with the most controversy as well. Many of this year's most noted films have a central message of winning over the bad guy. Actor and director Ben Affleck, who was celebrated with a special achievement in filmmaking trophy for his movie Argo, had a theory for the trend. Each year, the National Board Review Award winners are chosen by a group of film enthusiasts, students and filmmakers. The gala has long been considered a valid precursor to the Academy Awards nominations. American movie star Tom Cruise arrived in Japan to kick off his promotional tour of his new film, Jack Reacher, which will be released next month as Outlaw in Japan. The three-time Oscar-nominated actor signed autographs for hundreds of screaming fans gathered at Tokyo's Haneda Airport. Cruz's action movie Jack Reacher, which could be a new action movie franchise, features author Lee Child's former military investigator solving a fatal sniper attack. Cruz was also a producer on the Paramount Pictures movie released in the US on December 21st. As the US Senate Intelligence Committee began a review of contacts between the makers of the film Zero Dark Thirty and CIA officials, the film made its premiere in Washington DC Tuesday evening. In the latest controversy surrounding the film, the committee will examine records charting contracts between intelligence officials and film's director Catherine Bigelow and screenwriter Mark Bowell. The Oscar-winning director for The Hurt Locker said, she was surprised by the investigation and that the controversy and interrogation techniques strays from what the film's focus is. The film has been screened in New York and LA and will be in theatres nationwide 11th January. That's all we have for you in this edition of World Panorama. I'll be back next week, same time, with more world news. Till then, you can join us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. This week, we wrap up in China, where the annual Ice and Snow Festival in Harbin, famous for its enormous ice sculptures, goes Gangnam style in sub-zero temperatures. Goodbye, and thanks so much for watching.